Here's what's coming up on your horizon. Well, this week, downtown Oklahoma City turns blue and gold as members of the FFA gather from around the state. So what better time to look at farming's future? We begin our show by visiting with Oklahoma Agriculture's newest generation. There's, there's great opportunity in, in the farming industry. Uh, you know, with, with profit margins today, I feel like if an individual you know, does a good job on the farm and keeps accurate records, there's, there's definitely uh, enough income available to support a family. We'll show you how Oklahoma FFA's Hunger Challenge is helping some fellow students not worry about their next meal. If there's an opportunity to give, we give. And as we mark the 20th anniversary of the Murrah Building bombing in Oklahoma City, we look at how out of tragedy merged a spirit of generosity that continues today. And we end our day on a much lighter note with some Oklahoma entrepreneurs who are behind a new sweet treat with a funny name. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's investment in career tech provides more than nationally recognized technology education and training. It produces solid financial returns for the state's economic future. Oklahoma Career Tech, elevating our economy. And the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. And now, from the Career Tech Studios in Stillwater, here's your host, Rob McClendon. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us here on Horizon. Well, founded in 1928 as the Future Farmers of America, the FFA changed its name some 60 years later to just the FFA to reflect that members in the country's largest youth organizations, their interests, well, they also encompass science, business, and natural resources. But it is the business of food and fiber that today remains one of the FFA's strengths, creating a new generation of farmers and ranchers that we will all depend upon. Our Andy Barth introduces us to farming's future. I got started when uh, I was about oh, four or five years old. I'd always go riding the tractor with my dad. And uh, when I was younger than that, he'd always sit the car seat in the tractor. I'd ride, ride right there alongside him all day long. Agriculture is in their blood. Uh, I'm the fifth generation in my family. My family has uh, farmed and ranched in the colony, southwest Oklahoma area, for over 100 years. And for these young producers, it is their way of life. We're a diversified farming operation, uh, with crops and livestock, uh, crops mainly being wheat, canola, double crop soybeans, corn, milo, and alfalfa. And then we run, <coughs> run a cow-calf operation, uh, as well as uh, develop heifers, uh, northern heifers, and some of better replacements. Travis Schneithman and his brother Tyler are the fifth generation in their family to farm in Garber, Oklahoma, a legacy deeply rooted in FFA. In FFA, uh, my involvement began in, in eighth grade and, and really kind of started out very small. Uh, started out with, with actually seven acres of, of wheat and it kind of developed a passion in me and uh, from there I, I, I was able to expand my operation over the years. Uh, FFA taught me a lot. Uh, taught me a lot about responsibility, uh, confidence, being able to stand up in front of a group of people. First of all, we feel fortunate that we've, we had the opportunity to, to be involved in FFA and agriculture education. Uh, it's really done a lot as far as uh, discipline, uh, record keeping uh, that we use every day on the farm. A sentiment shared by Clayton Mack, who farms with his family down the road in Drummond. If I didn't have the FFA, I wouldn't be standing here today. Having as much success is what I do today. A success that took him to the top. And the winner is Clayton Mack, Oklahoma. Mack was named the 2014 national winner for his fiber and oil crop production. Yet he says his real accomplishment happens every day on the farm. I go from working cattle to checking cattle to getting to run combines, getting to run the tractors. I mean, I get to do everything under the sun that a lot of people wish they could do, and I get to do it every day in my backyard. No matter how big a backyard can be, Zach Weichel of Colony, Oklahoma was named the 2014 American Star Farmer. Zach Weichel from Oklahoma. The highest honor an FFA member can receive. 
and honor made possible by those before him. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have been in that. I wouldn't have been on that stage if it hadn't been for the, you know, the generations before me, you know, my grandfather and my dad up there at the national level. Yeah, I was, I was pretty happy for myself, but also, you know, I wanted to, that made me feel good that I was able to show them that, yeah, I did make something out of the opportunity you gave me. Here's, you know, here, I'm giving it back to you. Here you go. And the Schneithman brothers, they're star farmers too. Travis won the national honor back in 2008 and Tyler was named Oklahoma Star Farmer in 2013, with plans to run for the national title in two years. It's a great honor. Uh, there's a lot of people that, that went into making that happen. It just wasn't us. I was more than excited uh, you know, to, to receive the award, but at the same time, I, I felt like they're, they're, you know, on stage really should have been a, several other people you know, that, that probably should have been standing there with me or, or maybe even more. And while these four young producers are stars in their fields, they understand the uphill battle U.S. agriculture will face. You lose a lot of jobs. Um, I really think that uh, agriculture is very important and uh, people that don't realize that, we need to help educate them on how important agriculture really is. The United States Department of Agriculture predicts the world population will reach 9 billion by 2050. And producers like Weichel must be ready to feed that growing number of mouths. Huge responsibility. 2050, we're gonna have to produce double the amount too. And while farming is rooted in tradition, Weichel says current trends can help farmers produce more. Technology is not a bad thing. I think technology is a good thing. I mean, the world's not getting any bigger. About the same size with a lot more people. And for the Schneithman brothers, farming together makes them better producers. You know, I'll be the first to admit there are, there are times we have our, our disagreements, but uh, those are usually typically worked out uh, in a fairly timely manner and usually pretty easily. We use each other as a bouncing board, bounce ideas off each other, and, and uh, it's, it's been a great, we feel like we've been a great team. Uh, we, we get along really good for the most part. Uh, where we sometimes struggle with is, is convincing dad, you know, and a little bit older generations to adopt new technologies and, and why we should spend money on this and how it's going to benefit us. Uh, so a lot of times we're, we feel like we team up against, against dad, but, but he's, he's great to work with too. Uh, we wouldn't be here farming if it wasn't for him. U.S. farmers make up less than 1% of the country's population. A big responsibility but one that Max says is an honor to take on. Knowing that uh, I'm one of few that can actually produce food for our country and help our country out, and uh, knowing that I can provide for myself if I have to, it, uh, it really makes me feel good about myself and what I do. And for Tyler, now is a great time to come back to the farm. I feel like uh, there's, there's great opportunity in, in the farming industry. Uh, you know, with, with profit margins today, I feel like if an individual, you know, does a good job on the farm and keeps accurate records, there's, there's definitely uh, enough income available to support a family. And so, uh, again, I feel like the demand, uh, the demand for, for young individuals like myself returning to the farm is, is great. Um, I feel like the, the average size of the, the, uh, the American farm is growing, so farmers are able to, to farm more acres and thus hopefully uh, generate more income. I feel like as, as a young producer and in, uh, involved in agriculture, I, you know, at a pivotal point in my time, I couldn't be more excited to return to the farm. Four young producers, impacted by FFA, all working to feed a hungry world. Well, FFA is an integral part of the Agricultural Education Division of the Oklahoma Career Tech System. With more than 27,000 members, the Oklahoma FFA Association is the fifth largest in the nation whose mission is to make a positive difference in the lives of students by developing their potential for premier leadership, personal growth, and career success through agricultural education. And when we return, we will have a great example of exactly how that works. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon featuring some of the good things that are happening in the great state of Oklahoma. Well, this past year, Oklahoma FFA members donated 347 animals to Oklahoma's two largest food banks, all as a part of the FFA Hunger Challenge. And the results, well, they've been phenomenal. 
enough food to create over a half a million protein sticks to supply the food bank's Backpacks for Kids program for a full year. Welcome to the big time. In the livestock judging world, it doesn't get much more competitive are more lucrative than the Oklahoma yes. Youth Expo. I sold the Grand Mare. Since its beginnings in 2002, OYE has provided 2.1 million in scholarships to more than 1,000 Oklahoma students. But for every winner, there doesn't have to be a loser. Winning the second ever Diamond Hats Animal Donation Challenge is the Shattuck 4-H and FFA chapter. Beginning in 2013, a growing number of exhibitors are donating their animals to the Regional Food Bank of Oklahoma. Shattuck FFA, naturally, we've always, if there's an opportunity to give, we give. Paige Gosney is president of her local FFA chapter. When we came to OYE and we heard that there was an opportunity to donate our animals um, to hunger, to the cause for hunger, we just saw that as a great opportunity and we kind of all came together and saw that as the right thing to do. One in four Oklahoma children struggles with hunger, a problem that takes us out of the show ring and across town. This is the Regional Food Bank of Oklahoma. Inside this warehouse, there's more than four million pounds of food. Four million pounds of food that will be distributed this month to over 90,000 people a week, and 40% of those children. We got a call from the school principal and told us they had a child literally standing in line for school breakfast, passed out, and they discovered that child had nothing to eat all weekend but a hot dog with no bun, and they called and asked us what we could do about it, and that's... Rodney Bevins is the executive director of the Regional Food Bank and says that's when they began their Backpack for Kids program. Well, it's a really simple program that we you know school identifies the child who has very little or nothing to eat over the weekend and they get a backpack on Friday afternoon to bridge that gap from school lunch on Friday at 11 11 30 until school breakfast on Monday morning. Last year the Backpack for Kids program fed more than 15,000 students in 477 schools across central and western Oklahoma. We we're putting beef sticks in our backpacks and we didn't know where they're even being produced and we didn't like all the ingredients in it. I said, that doesn't make sense to me. We're a beef state. We should produce these in our own state. And so we started talking to various people in the state, the Oklahoma Farm Bureau, Beef Council, other people, the Pork Council involved in the project and came up with a novel concept. We produce these, get the beef donated in the state of Oklahoma. We have a processor in Chickasha, Oklahoma that processes them for us, then Ralph's meat packing plant in Perkins puts them into beef sticks, so it's a win-win situation. Since its inception, the beef for backpacks and pork for packs has grown to the point of about 40,000 of these sticks being packed up for chronically hungry children every month. I think it's tremendous less. You know, the whole FFA program, it's not just about raising the animals, that's a really a critical part of it, it's about leadership, teaching those skills to those young men and women that can be successful throughout their lives. Good week. Oklahoma youth, helping other children they may never meet, avoid hunger while learning a lesson that could last a lifetime. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, it's a sweet treat with a funny name. We'll meet the creators of Billy Goat Ice Cream. But first, out of tragedy, an Oklahoma standard. April 19, 1995 altered the face of Oklahoma and even the nation. Yet despite the tragedy of the Murrah Federal Building bombing, among the most lasting memories are those of Oklahomans banding together in community-wide displays of support. That spirit of generosity became known as the Oklahoma Standard, something that even two decades later is still going strong. Earlier, I visited with Kerry Watkins, Executive Director, and Susan Winchester, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Oklahoma City National Memorial and Museum. So it's now been 20 years in many ways. It just doesn't feel like it, does it? You know, we've, we've, met, we've accomplished a lot in the last two decades, and I think for, for me, it, it's moved pretty quickly. But for Susan and families who have tried to pick their lives up and move forward, I think it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. And we did get to meet your family, the family right. of Peggy Clark, uh -huh. Dr. Peggy Clark. 
And I, I've told people this year in particular that 20 years since um, April 19th, 1995, my three little girls have grown up. They've all married, they have families, careers, successful, some of the amazing, most amazing young women I've ever known. I'm so proud of each and every one of them. And, and I think it's probably fair to say, but for everyone that was directly involved in, in the bombing, there are not only some scars, but some lessons learned. We can't really educate without remembering, and we don't want to re remember without educating. I mean, they go hand in hand, and so we we want to remember what got us to this point and what happened. And, and so <clears throat> in our exhibits and our lessons and our interactives in the museum, you know, we challenge people to, to delve into that story and to learn it. Mm -hmm. but, and despite the evil that we saw there, we've seen go good come of it, and I just can't help but notice the, the buttons that both of you are wearing as the OS for the Oklahoma Standard. Tell me about that. This came out of our strategic planning session last fall. Um, one of the members of the board moved to Oklahoma from another state and was so impressed with the way, with who we are, the, the values that we have, the way we respond, and pointed out to us in so many ways you don't recognize what you have, how truly special you are. That's something that you need to never forget, to instill in those that were not here and to that not here either because they were too young or because they've moved here and make it a part of the culture that lives on forever. And so we developed through his help, Sam Presti, the general manager of the Thunder, through his help, this Oklahoma Standard campaign, where during the month of April we're asking people to do three things, one act of service, one act of kindness, and one act of honor, just to, to uh, reinforce the idea of the Oklahoma Standard and to continue that tradition going forward. Mm -hmm. and, and again, playing off of something that was established during the bombing, during the aftermath. Well, people stopped and watched how Oklahomans responded. They couldn't believe you know, people would line up and stay in line for hours to give blood or to take supplies, raincoats, batteries, dog booties, whatever it was. People sat at their homes all across the country and were in awe of how Oklahomans took care of Oklahomans. And rescue workers and visiting journalists all talked about it. Like, they, I came with this $10, I'm leaving with the same $10. I never paid for a thing while I was here. O Oklahomans took care of me. And uh, journalist Tom Brokaw, you know, wrote a piece for a, a book we'll hand down the 19th that is jaw-dropping. I mean, he talks about how unbelievable it was to watch Oklahomans at work. And I think, you know, we, we're used to people being good and treating others like we want to be treated, but that's not necessarily the case around the country. And I think that's a lesson we can learn and make sure we teach this next generation. Mm -hmm. And how are you going about trying to do that then? Well, the campaign is, you know, multimedia, social media, um, heavily engaged, asking people to do these acts and then to, to you know, report on them via social media. And then the other way is making sure that in our educational outreach that we're teaching in a way that is, they can bring it back to the story. So we're, we're developing a learning lab based on STEM. Uh, and so we'll have the lessons of forensics, environment, <clears throat> structural engineer, many other lessons that will bring you back to the event of 1995 and the lessons learned from it. Yet it's using today's technology and curriculum to get us there. Knowing what both of you know now from the experiences that you've, you've seen there at the museum and the memorial and, and with your family and being part of the foundation, how would you like to see this, how would you like to see Oklahoma go forward from here? Oh, I think Oklahoma is absolutely on the right direction and has been and to see that momentum and that enthusiasm that ultimately came out of something bad where everyone did come together and move us forward. To see that continue even in a, in a stronger fashion than it is right now would be such a tribute to, to not only the people of Oklahoma City, the people of Oklahoma, the people of the United States. I would say to, to find that unity we found in 1995. I mean, there was no turnpike or interstate that divided the state. We were one state. We were one Oklahoma. And people did what they had to do. And I think fast forward 20 years, you know, we're an ultra red state and some people aren't ultra red and so you've got to figure out where the happy medium is and meet people where they are and be willing to do that and that comes from all facets of life you know religion politics everyday life and living and 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 that worked in 1995 it didn't matter what your background was what your skin color was what how you voted it just mattered that we were Oklahomans and we we're going to make sure we took care of each other Carrie mm -hmm. Watkins Susan Winchester thank you for what you're doing and thanks for being here thank you Want to share something you've seen here today? Well, all of our episodes are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. Or you can subscribe to our weekly free podcast on iTunes. 
Well, two Stillwater entrepreneurs are adding a healthy twist on dessert with goat's milk. Billy Goat Ice Cream started as a class project and is quickly growing into a successful full-time business. Joining me now to tell their story is our Courtney May. Billy Goat Ice Cream Company uses all natural and locally grown ingredients to make the goat's milk ice cream. The product is lactose friendly and has less than half of the fat of traditional ice cream. So you can indulge your cravings without breaking any rules. It's a healthier version of America's favorite dessert with a name you can't forget, Billy Goat Ice Cream. And I get a hard, a hard time with the name Billy Goat, you know, and, and, and in uh, the ag world, they're like, you know, milk doesn't come from a Billy Goat. And I was like, I know, I know, but that's the only goat at the time that I knew was a Billy Goat, so just kind of stuck. <laughs> Where Sean Robinson's business started as an idea for Sorry, a class project where he met co-owner Caleb Neal. And after winning a competition, the two entrepreneurs took Billy Goat by yeah, the horns and created a real business. And we are so ready for people just to try our ice cream and just to see that it can be just like regular ice cream and that it is so much healthier for you. And for those people that are lactose intolerant, for them to be able to eat our ice cream, just we cannot wait to be able to see those things. With half the fat of traditional ice cream, the health benefits of ice cream made from goat's milk are undeniable. It's easier to digest if you're lactose intolerant. Um, you can still digest our product. Uh, there's more calcium, more potassium, doesn't deteriorate against bone density. I mean, just all around, lots of vitamins and nutrients. A nutritious scoop of dessert with a bold taste. We have a garden mint, uh, bourbon vanilla bean, uh, dark chocolate, uh, coffee, cacao chip, and my personal favorite, our salted caramel. And the local business prides itself in using products and ingredients made, raised, and grown in Oklahoma. We receive uh, raw goat smoke from different local farms around Oklahoma, uh, and we do the pasteurization process, you know, everything in the house. You know, we're making everything from scratch. I mean, even if it's the cookies that we're, we'll add in some flavors, or it's candied pecans, or, or anything like that, you know, we're, we're starting from, you know, the, the bare foundation. But this tasty business would not be possible without the help from Meridian Technology Center for Business Development. Billy Goat Ice Cream is a tenant in its business incubator. Meridian has been great uh, to work with. I mean, just in the general sense, when we first started out, when we were looking for uh, a space to set up shop, you know, and, that, uh, and the space here was identified to us uh, through Meridian and the Center for Business Development. So when it came to placement, you know, we had to outfit essentially a you know factory floor, and they've really helped us kind of lay the space out uh, effectively, so that way we can not only um, operate in it um, efficiently, but also grow into it as well. So. And Ron Duggins, director of the Center for Business Development at Meridian says Billy Goat is an example of how businesses can reach success through their business incubator. Billy Goat Ice Creams is, is, is a nice company. We're very proud of uh, where they're going right now. We've seen them take this abstract idea and try to make something concrete out of it. Billy Goat's a great example of seeing that come to fruition. A made in Oklahoma business coming to a store near you. Our purpose, you know, we look forward to creating jobs and contributing back to the local economy, uh, you know, and really being a community-based a community company. You know, we love service and giving back uh, and really connecting with other individuals. I mean, it's, it's really what we pride ourselves on and, you know, kind of why we do what we do and, and really being, you know, good business. You know, our tagline is be good, eat ice cream. So we want to make sure that we're being good and, and, and all the things that we're doing. So mm. that's good. And because Billy Goat Ice Cream is a healthier version of traditional ice cream, Robinson and Neil are reaching out to health food stores for their product to be sold in. And the company's goal is for the ice cream to be available in multiple stores across the United States within the next five years. So where can we get a bite right now? It's available to purchase online and it's also in three Stillwater businesses, Aspen Coffee, Food Pyramid, and the Hampton Inn and Suites. All right. Thanks so much, Court. You're welcome, Rob. You can keep up with us throughout the week. Just head to OKHorizon.com where you can see more of any of our stories, read our reporters behind the scenes blogs, see what others are saying about us on Twitter, and face the facts with our regular updates. So reach out and touch us anywhere and anytime. It's a problem that most states can only wish they had. Too many jobs and not enough qualified people to fill them. Next time in Oklahoma Horizon, we look at filling the skills gap.
We're seeing more and more retirements coming up of legacy knowledge leading uh, our uh, operations, and we're needing more and more young people to go into those type of skill, uh, skilled positions. New jobs for a new economy on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, that is going to wrap us up for today, but you can see more of any of our stories on our website at okhorizon.com. You can listen to us on the go with our weekly podcast on iTunes, follow us throughout the week on Twitter at OK Horizon TV, or just become a Horizon fan on Facebook. I'm Rob McClendon. Thanks for including us in your day. See you back here next week. Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education and the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping good people grow good things. Thank you for watching Oklahoma Horizon.